Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. I'll be joined by our Week in Review guests for our regular show in just a moment. But first, some of today's top stories. Police and anti-violence activists announce a $10,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of a suspect in the killing of an 8-year-old girl over Labor Day. DeJore Wilson was shot while riding inside a vehicle in Canaryville on the south side. Police say they believe the vehicle Wilson was in targeted possibly due to an ongoing gang conflict in the area and they're urging community members to come forward. So we're calling out to the community today. Reach out to us. Provide us information because we need some justice for this family. Some warm sentiments shared between Mayor Lori Lightfoot and the Trump family. The mayor's office revealed text messages today sent between her and the president's son, Eric Trump, acting on behalf of the Trump Organization. The two texts are from early June and then again in late July, thanking the mayor for having police officers protect Trump Tower from looting and vandalism. In the June text, Mr. Trump says, quote, Mrs. Mayor, know that I have been thinking about you. I still appreciate the call you made to me, which was a class act. I only imagine how difficult the situation is, but no, we are all rooting for Chicago. I hope you are well, Eric T. WTTW received the texts in response to a Freedom of Information request. University of Illinois Hospital is bracing for a nurses' strike tomorrow. More than 800 nurses represented by the Illinois Nurses Association are set to picket over the issue of safe staffing, meaning they want a limit on the number of patients that can be assigned to each nurse. The nurses join an expected 2,000 SEIU employees at the university that are also set to go on strike next week. Illinoisans left unemployed because of COVID, well, there's some new opportunities for jobs out there. Governor J.B. Pritzker announces $16 million in federal funding to be allocated toward training and placing nearly 1,300 Illinois residents for new jobs. The money will be distributed through local workforce organizations supporting occupations like health coordinators, food distribution, and emergency pantry workers. This money comes from two new grants given by the U.S. Department of Labor. This federal funding made possible by the Department of Labor's Employment Recovery and Disaster Recovery Grant programs will help us address a goal for invigorating our economy that is twofold. Returning more of our residents to the jobs uh, that they once had while simultaneously addressing new economic demands that have been brought on by COVID-19. And Illinois public health officials announced more than 2,100 new cases of COVID-19 since yesterday and 32 additional deaths. That makes for a total of nearly 250,000 cases, 258,000 cases and more than 8,200 deaths and a seven-day positivity rate of 3.9%. And IDPH says 30 Illinois counties are currently at a warning level for coronavirus, including DuPage and Grundy in the Chicago metro area. That means positivity rates are nearing 8% and new cases and deaths are rising at a rapid clip, among other factors. And now joining us from various locations around town are Nader Issa of the Chicago Sun-Times, Gregory Pratt of the Chicago Tribune, our very own Heather Sharon of WTTW News, and Laura Washington, who I think is getting her camera all set up there. Uh, let's jump right into it. So this week we had a committee uh, in the uh, the uh, state capitol, Springfield, a rarely, rarely used committee to meet about a probe into House Speaker Mike Madigan. Let's hear some sound bites from Representative that. Madigan engaged in conduct which is unbecoming to a legislator or which constitutes a breach of public trust as detailed in the admissions by Commonwealth Edison and the deferred prosecution agreement, including engaging in a bribery scheme, an extortion scheme, conspiracy to violate federal and state laws amongst other misconduct and misuse of the office. So Heather, this committee basically met they decided they had to coordinate with the U.S. Attorney's Office to see, you know, what evidence they could get, what investigating they could do. Uh, where is this going? Well, that's a really good question, and nobody quite knows at this point because they don't really have a clear plan yet because they said, well, we're concerned that we might be interfering with the ongoing federal investigation, so let's wait to issue subpoenas and call witnesses. So it's a little bit unclear sort of what the ultimate outcome will be, but it's clear that the Republicans see this as an opportunity to shine the spotlight on House Speaker Michael Madigan 
Reagan, who of course is sort of wrapped up in this ComEd scandal, although he de he declares that he has done nothing wrong um, and, ha and he has not been charged. And the person everyone might want to hear from is House Speaker Mike Madigan himself. Laura Washington, I believe you were having some audio problems, but uh, if you're back, I'm, I'm here. She's okay. She's she's still not there. So I'll address this question to Greg Pratt. Will Mike Madigan be called to testify? Well, that's a great question. I'm sure I'm sure he will fight that as much as possible, as long as it's possible. It seems unlikely that that that's going to be happening anytime soon. But you know, he is really hanging on for power. Uh, more tenuously maybe than it seems, although he's still got his he's still got his fundraising, he's still making money for the party, he's still in control that way. But he is under attack from so many quarters. And it's gonna if if the feds ever indict him, which he has not been charged or accused of a crime, uh, he you know, that's all gonna fall apart pretty quickly. Because you can see the shark circling around the speaker right now. And at the same time, the federal shark circled around a top ComEd lobbyist late last week, announcing a criminal charge against Fidel Marquez. Uh, Nader Issa, are there other shoes to drop here in this whole ComEd Madigan imbroglio? Well, I mean, you'd have to think so, right? The the headlines this week were this is a rarely used uh, a mechanism in, in the state house, and yet this is, this is the second time in the past year that it's been used. Um, for, for the Madigan hearing. And it just shows you how active this investigation has been, how widespread it's been. Um, I mean, just just last week, or the, the weeks are blending together, maybe it was the week before, um, Janice Jackson, the CPS CEO, her uh, chief of staff um, today pleaded guilty. He was, he was indicted uh, a little bit ago um, for a, a tangentially related investigation. But today we're sort of finding out details that this was was um, a little bit connected to Danny Solis, and so this is just really widespread. There's there's so many different moving pieces, and it would be it would be almost impossible, I think, to imagine that there's not going to be something else to come out of this. Yeah, many tentacles, Nader, and you're referring to Danny Solis, the former alderman who allegedly wore a wire, and that's perhaps some of the evidence that the feds had on Madigan and ComEd connected to this whole CPS issue. Heather, I'll go back to you. Um, Pot, that's been in the news this week. 21 finalists chosen for 75 new potential licenses. Why is it so controversial? Well, these licenses were supposed to go to quote unquote social equity applicants. So that's people who have been arrested for drug crimes, who live in an area where there's been a disproportionate number of drug arrests, or who work for a company. And there's been a lot of controversy about who was selected to enter this lottery because only about 60% are firms owned by Black and Latino Illinoisans. So there are a lot of people who are upset with that ratio. And several people have gone to federal court to try to stop this lottery. Now, Governor J.B. Pritzker has said so far that he plans to move forward with this effort and that Illinois has basically done the best job it could and better than any other state he says to sort of use legal marijuana as a way to sort of make up for the horrible impact it had on black and brown communities uh, not only in Chicago but statewide. Laura Washington I believe we have you back so to what Heather said is this program living up to its stated goal to provide social equity to help out the communities that have been disproportionately hit by the drug war? Can you hear me, Paris? I can hear you, Laura. Yep. Okay, great. You, well, I think that uh, the Prisoner administration is, is uh, at least indirectly admitted that they have some work to do. The sex, social equity applicants, uh, obviously, there there's much unhappiness with the way that turned out in terms of how the scoring was done. And some of the applicants seem to have a leg up because they just had the capacity to uh, submit multiple applications, and that's all about having the resources and the time and and the and the staff staff power, staff power to do it. So they were they, they they had a leg up because of that, and that that seems to be like a no brainer that some someone in the administration should have anticipated when they were designing this program. And in fact, some of the critics have said 
that they that this was brought up during the design and it was pretty much this issue was ignored so they've, they've said they're going to try to fix those problems but in the meantime the damage has been done well i would be shocked to find out that a lot of interests representing those organizations perhaps had help or a say in crafting that law uh, let's move on to u.s attorney general bill barr he was here this week to tout operation legend but mayor lori lightfoot disputed what's behind chicago's recent crime reduction take a look Together, federal, state, and local law enforcement in Chicago, working as part of Operation Legend and our joint task forces, have reversed that dangerous spike in violence. We started to see a downward trend in shootings and homicides really beginning in late July. The first additional federal um, agents who, that came to Chicago as part of Operation Legend didn't even get here until August 3rd. All right, Laura Washington, I'll go back to you. Both CPD and the U.S. Attorney General are announcing that, you know, murders have gone down by 50 percent in the last seven weeks. I mean, 2020 is still a year where Chicago will likely see its most homicides since the mid-90s. Is it really time for a victory lap? You took the words right out of my mouth, Paris. Absolutely not. I mean, we're talking about a few weeks, and the experts will tell you you can't make any judgment about any kind of crime rates over a few weeks. The numbers that jump out to me are the fact that the mayor had 8,000 cops on the street last weekend for Labor Day weekend, um, and yet we, we still had dozens of shootings, dozens, dozens of shootings and murders over that weekend. A, a, an eight-year-old girl is killed, shot through, apparently through some kind of a gang-related activity. Um, and so the, the violence and the crime and the, and, the, and the carnage goes on. And meantime, you've got Barr and, and Lightfoot fighting over whether or not the, the federal government gave enough resources and whether or not those resources were effective. Obviously, there's a lot of responsibility and blame to go around, and we've got a long way to go. Well, and let's talk about those federal resources. 200 new agents in departments like the U.S. Attorney's Office, FBI, DEA, 200 reassigned agents to investigate violent crime. Greg Pratt, does that make a difference in deterring crime because folks might know there are consequences? Well, on that, uh, I would guess not that, you know, the, the, the people driving crime, they understand that there'll be consequences. So a few extra bodies doesn't necessarily make a difference. Uh, criminologists uh, have wondered whether or not a few, even a couple hundred bodies, and the mayor, the mayor cast doubt that they even sent that many bodies. But even, even if they did, even if it's a full 200, you know, every once in a while, the city throws out an extra thousand cops on the street and it doesn't make much of a difference or it makes a minimal difference. So yeah, um, additional investigations, smart investigations uh, can help, but it, it is remarkable to see people uh, climbing over themselves to take credit for a relatively mild, mild uh, crime reduction in a terrible year where children under 16 are being shot over and over and young children are being killed. Seems to so be it's one of... Yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things that's just kind of strange to watch. Seems to be a strange message to put out there. You know, the Attorney General, Heather Sharon, also revealed that Mayor Lightfoot and President Trump got on the phone together, or at least associates involved with them got on the phone and agreed to these federal agents avoiding a situation like what happened in Portland. Is there something to be said here about bipartisan cooperation? I don't think so. Um, you know, you have to remember that this is not an unusual tactic for the federal and the city governments to do. Uh, this happened under Rahm Emanuel. This happened under Mayor Daley. Uh, this is not an unusual situation where there's been a surge in crime and the federal government has said, here, let's send more federal agents. And let's remember there this was a sequester uh, several years ago, a budget sequester, and it, it caused a hiring freeze at places like DOJ. So they were always complaining for more agents. But let me also right. ask you, Heather, I mean, U.S. Attorney John Lausch, was he instrumental in getting these resources? Yes, and uh, Lori Lightfoot was a former, is a former federal prosecutor. She's very close with John Lausch. And while she spared no sort of criticism of Attorney General Bill Barr, she made a point to thank John Lausch for his help, uh, no doubt wanting to sort of smooth that relationship because uh, they do have a good relationship. And when there was just widespread fear that Chicago was going to be targeted in the way that the Trump administration targeted Portland, Oregon, uh, she vouched for John 
Lausch and said, look, he's going to be in charge and I trust him. So that is a crucial relationship. And if you want to call that bipartisan, that's that's probably as much bar bipartisan cooperation we're going to see at least in the near future. But certainly federal and city cooperation, which is good to see. All right, let's talk about presidential politics. President Donald Trump is in damage control right now as Bob Woodward releases stunning tapes from some of his 18 interviews with the president who acknowledged the dangers of COVID-19, even when he said the exact opposite in public. And then let's hear what Joe Biden had to say in response. I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. He knew how deadly it was. It was much more deadly than the flu. He knew and purposely played it down. Worse, he lied to the American people. Nader Issa, the president in these phone conversations acknowledges COVID is deadly. It's much worse than the flu. It affects young people and it's airborne, completely contradicting what he said in public while he was holding rallies. Is this something that will enrage folks that are already not going to vote for Trump and not sort of hit the president's base? I mean, he's he's done so much over the past four years, and every week there's a new scandal. I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure where this one reaches that level for people who are still on board um, with the Trump administration. I, I do also want to want to say that Bob Woodward, I mean, released this this tape, um, these quotes, months and months and months after uh, after President Trump told him that in behind closed doors that. Uh, that this was more dangerous than he was letting on in public. And I'm, I'm in terms of the journalism ethics of it, I'm not quite sure where he thought it would be okay to, to save, uh, save this for months. I, I would argue that maybe lives were lost because this wasn't published until months later. Um, as, far as, as far as supporters of the president now flipping because of this, I, I mean, he can come out and say, look, I want it. And they've already done, done this, right, his press secretary. I wanted to keep everyone calm. Um, I wasn't lying to you. I just I'm being a leader, and and people people buy that. They eat it up, and I I don't think this really changes much. Laura Washington, you know, uh, many folks do not trust what the president has to say, since uh, a lot of what he says is untethered from reality. But many of his supporters hang on to to what he says and do trust him. Does this hurt his supporters the most when? He acknowledges how deadly it is and continues to have rallies without masks or social distancing. Well, many of his supporters, Paris, agree with his perspective, and they, they're happy to go to the rallies and uh, without masks, without social distancing. They're happy to see their president go all over the country and in, in, in many in, to many locations and, and engage with voters without wearing a mask himself. That's okay with them. I think they discount even when you see a tape, even when you listen to a tape, and the evidence is clear. Uh, and it's irrefutable. They discount it and, and they buy into his argument that it's all fake news and it's all part of a conspiracy. That's a sad truth. So I don't think this is the, the, the Woodward's tapes are going to change anything about that. But I do agree with Nader that it's just outrageous and appalling that Woodward would hold, these, hold back these tapes for the purposes of publishing a book. He says that he was he needed more time to check it out. But come on, first of all, we, we know from the beginning that Trump is, has been has been hiding information. All he had to do was ask the experts at the CDC. All he had to do was ask Dr. Anthony Fauci, and he has the resources and the context to be able to nail, the, nail that story down a lot sooner than he, than he did and go public with it. Certainly, and he uh, should have done that. Certainly a debate you happening uh, about journalistic ethics there, Laura. Let's move on to some city news. Chicago Public Schools fall semester starts remotely. Chicago starts to slowly replace lead water service pipes. City Council approves a plan to help keep Woodlawn residents who are near the planned Obama Center in their homes and bans flavored vaping products. Uh, let's first hear from CPS CEO Janice Jackson talking on our show this week about the first week of virtual learning. We made uh, a decision, um, I think it was the right decision to go with the all remote option for the beginning of the school year because we heard from our teachers, our parents, um, as well as our principals that they thought that that was the best approach. So I feel like the district was prepared. If you look at the launch of the school year uh, for Chicago Public Schools and compare that to other school districts, I would say it was a relatively smooth opening. Nader, attendance is down a bit from last year, although not so bad. How did this first week go? It actually, dare I say, went kind of smoothly. I mean, knock on wood for, for the families who 
uh, are, are hoping not to not to see a change in that. But I mean, talking to principals, teachers, students, people are surprised at how smoothly this first week went. It wasn't without hiccups. I mean, there are hiccups every year, especially now not being in school buildings. But a, a, a lot of people um, thought it, it didn't go as bad as they quite expected. Today, the district released some attendance numbers for this first week which I will say is unprecedented transparency from CPS. And there were about four, four out of every five students uh, logged on uh, uh, to, to classes this week compared to in some schools around 50%, 40%, 20% in the spring. And so there, there's really been an improvement um, and, and the, the bit of planning that went into it and getting kids internet and, and computers has really helped. A part of that, Greg Pratt, is that technology gap. Does every student have internet access and a, a device that needs one? No, I don't think that they do, although I know they're working on it. I do know they, they keep saying, you know, if, if you don't have it, call your school and they'll they'll help you out. And, and one can hope because it's, uh, you know, as a CPS grad, uh, you know, I understand those challenges and it's important for our kids. All right, so, great. Greg, also so, this week, uh, the mayor announces replacing uh, lead pipes in 750 homes that'll start shortly. That's 750 out of 400,000 homes. Uh, why start so small with this program? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating dynamic to watch because on the one hand, they're saying the water is fine, everything is good, but we need to replace all of the pipes. Why? We just do because it's important, but everything is fine and safe. And so we got to replace everything. Uh, but we're going to do it in this extremely slow fashion. But don't say it's slow because it, it makes us mad if you point out that it's slow. You know, the mayor got upset at her uh, floor leader, Gilbert Villegas, for tweeting that it would take like 500 years to do it. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a strange situation. But they, they are starting relatively slow, probably because it's a funding issue. You know, they, they identified some money to, to start off slow with. Um, to do it to do it for real would take billions of dollars. Five hundred city doesn't. Five hundred really years might also be the time frame that the city needs to pay down its pension debt. Uh, Heather Sharon, <laughs> will the city eventually find the money to to do this uh, in Moss? Well, your your guess is as good as mine. Um, if I was forced to guess, I would say that the only way to do a project like it is is to do it bit by bit. But it, it's really a problem that was left to Lori Lightfoot from Rahm Emanuel and from Richard Daly, who, you know, Chicago was the last major city to require lead service lines. And, you know, we've known for decades at this point that that metal can leach into the drinking water and pose a hazard especially for children and pregnant women. So, you know, I think Mayor Lightfoot probably wants credit for tackling the problem. Uh, the issue is, is like Greg was saying, is that if you have to say, hey, we need to replace these, but on the other hand, say everything's fine, don't worry, your water is safe. I think that's a little bit of a mixed message. And it's somewhat frightening, especially if you're a parent living in a home that has potentially water contaminated with lead. Um, because, you know, as a parent myself, we are warned, you know, ad nauseum about the dangers of lead. So it, it's, a, it's a real issue. But like everything else in the city, it comes down to dollars and cents, and there just isn't any money for this. And uh, another city issue involving dollars and cents is gentrification in Woodlawn, Laura Washington, due to the coming construction of the Obama Center. City Council agreed to a package to keep residents in their homes if gentrification does materialize. Is this a good compromise? It's, it's a great compromise, especially if you want to see that Obama Center go forward. It's been a long time in the making. And the, the most interesting thing about it is that it was the compromise was led and forged by Alderman Jeanette Taylor, who represents the Woodlawn area who has been a force around bringing this together from the very beginning and she herself is a is a, has a background as a community organizer a la barack obama and she was able to bring uh this to the fore and get lori lightfoot to the table even though they originally started with two two very different proposals and it's going to ensure ensure that lower income families have an option to stay one of the most interesting aspects of it is that uh department dwellers and people in apartment buildings if that apartment building uh, if the owner of the apartment building decides to put up for sale the, the residents there will have a first shot at pulling together the funds to be able to buy it because of, of course one of the biggest problems with the 
expectations for the Obama Center is that it's creating gentrification, pushing up uh, housing prices and pushing out lower income folks. So it's, it's a big victory. Now there's still work to be done ar around issues in High Park and South Shore, which will also will be affected by the, the development of the center, but it's a good start. It was a heavy lift and I, I saw Mayor Life at once this uh, vote passed, sort of have a relieved smile on her face, knowing that this is uh, a signature accomplishment, at least uh, so far this year. Uh, Nader, we only have about a half a minute left. Uh, let's uh, have some fun here. Amid uh, all of this news uh, around the country and in Chicago, we have football coming back. The Bears are uh, going to get on the field against the Detroit Lions. What do you think is going to happen? Well, it's bittersweet to have football back, right? Because uh, one, we get football back, and two, we have to watch the Bears. And so <laughs> I think uh, I think I'm going to go with a five to three final score. The Bears get a field goal in the safety, and they pull it out five to three. And I have to say, I have a close friend from Detroit who I'm looking forward to having a miserable Sunday. God bless you. <laughs> Detroit and Chicago football fans certainly have had many of those. Okay, we're out of time, so my thanks to Nader Issa, Gregory Pratt, Heather Sharon, and Laura Washington. And that is our show for this Friday night. Don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight and the Week in Review streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. And join us next week live at 7. And be sure to watch the premiere of Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, tomorrow at 6, and then Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, on Sunday at 6, right here on WTTW. After that, Bears 5-3 to three win. And now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great weekend. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.